Hey guys, we want to welcome you all to SOAR tonight, and uh, we're really glad to have you guys with us. It's been an incredible journey that we're on. We just are so glad that uh, all of you are here and welcome you online, and uh, we're delighted to have each of you with us. It really has been an incredible day, and I know it seems like I say that every week, but we are really at a time in America that is a critical moment. And I just believe with all of my heart, and you're going to hear me say this many, many times, I really believe that the keys for America's greatest awakening begin in a posture of humility. I believe that it is continued in that place of honor, where we learn to honor and prefer one another, and then also pursuing the heart of the Father, or His holiness in our lives personally, and for our communities as well. We're really, really excited. It's been a pretty amazing week for us, and I won't take you through all of that, but we had another great weekend in Mississippi that we're just coming off of, and on Sunday night, we really tried something that we've not uh, done before, but we just really believe that as we, as we rediscover the ancient path of the fathers who've gone before us, of the pioneers who's gone before us, that we're learning many things from them. And last night, I began to take some of those principles and I began to implement them in Mississippi. And the, the result was just absolutely amazing. And uh, we'll be sharing more of that with you. We are going to Kentucky this week. So if you are anywhere in the uh, seven states that surround Kentucky, we invite you to join us next weekend on Saturday, we're going to be in Lexington, Kentucky, as we uh, gather there for the Jesus Rally. And uh, we're so excited to be gathering. We so much appreciate uh, Brittany, who's the leader of this and is really calling uh, Kentucky to a deeper place of united prayer. And we just honor the work and the effort that her and her team are doing. And we're so glad to partner with her in this and labor with her in this. And so we're just really excited as we're going to see Kentucky come together uh, this coming week, Saturday from 2 to 8, right there in Lexington, Kentucky. So come on out and join us. We're bringing in our good friends, Will Ford and Matt Lockett, uh, for that gathering as well. And as some of you all know, uh, Lexington has gleaned national attention. And uh, there's even some prospect that on that day, there may be a national rally that's going to be uh, in close proximity to the uh, baseball stadium where we're gathering. But we are believing God for 10,000 in Kentucky uh, this coming week. So come on out on uh, Saturday of this week and join us if you can. Uh, we got to get right into our lesson uh, tonight. We're going to jump in our first lesson uh, this evening. Uh, I've just got a lot of information that I want to share with you. And uh, as maybe you have seen on our Facebook or heard us on our Facebook Live the other night, uh, the Lord is just doing amazing things up in the Northeast. We're so excited about what God's doing in Pennsylvania and Delaware and so many of the surrounding states there. And uh, we're glad to be partnering with the Key Fellowship and Ruth Willard and and uh, Pastor Chris Nito and others right there uh, in that northeast region really crying out for America's greatest awakening in that region of the country. And uh, let me remind you that we are going to be uh, partnering up in the northeast to do the eight capital cities tour. I appreciate you uh, SOAR students who have contacted me about your interest and the potential involvement in the eight city eight cities capital tour so if you're interested be sure and let us know and uh, we really want to involve you and include you in any way and in every way that we can also be praying about awaken the dawn uh, we're going to be there involved in that so uh, be sure and uh, make plans now to come to awaken the dawn uh, in washington dc in october now we got to get right into this lesson i'm so excited uh, about this lesson tonight and uh, we're, we're beginning to look at the touch of God upon a life, uh, identifying pioneers. And specifically tonight, we're going to be looking at a very interesting pioneer. And we're going to be looking at a wonderful, really, 
a miraculous contribution that he has made, not to the, just the church, not just to the church in the first great awakening, but indeed to every generation after his time. He was a man of simplicity. He was a man highly trained in discipline. And he was a man that God really used and continues to use today in, a, in really some incredible ways. Almost 300 years after uh, his life. So let's get into a little bit of that introduction. And again, all of the notes are online there. And I hope that you've made yourself available to those so that you can follow through with us. Also, I want to just remind you that part of what we're trying to do through these notes is I'm really giving you kind of an expanded version of the notes so that you might find uh, opportunity for additional study on your own. But let's jump right into this tonight. I love Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7. It says, and of, of the angels, uh, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers flames of fire. And so tonight we're going to begin to look at the flames of fire. The fire of God in the lives of ordinary men and women. Who the pioneer that we're going to look at tonight, it is said of him, and it's even engraved on his headstone, that he built better than he knew. And so tonight we celebrate this pioneer, and we're going to introduce him to you in just a few moments. The dawn of, a greatest, of, of, of America's greatest awakening must be hastened through travailing intercession and bold acts of courage, developing deep roots of faithful persistence in our communities and in our regions. And let me just say, in all of the years, for about 10 years, we were connected with George Otis Jr. and the Sentinel Group. I was the chairman of his board for nearly 10 years. And in that process, one of the things that we found, the top thing, the number one identifying factor of communities and regions that had been transformed by the power of God through revival. The number one characteristic found in every community is persevering leadership. So tonight, I want to in this lesson call us and remind us to the pioneers who have gone before us who led with great perseverance. History is marked by Christian communities that fared miraculously well in dark and tragic days of adversity. However, Christian history is also marked by those who fared not so well and indeed utterly failed. So part of what I want to begin tonight in the introduction time is to begin to challenge you to let's look and let's look honestly at those communities, at those churches, at those ministries that were able to persevere, not just for a lifetime, but for generations, many of them. There are Christian communities and witnesses in the earth that have prevailed consistently for millennia. How is that possible? How do we build something as we have considered hosting the presence of the Lord? How do we do this in such a way that we're able to preserve it from one generation to the next, and then to the next, and to the next, and to the next? Has that been done before? It absolutely has. The earth is marked by great ministries that have persevered for millennia. But if that's true, it's also true that history is marked by those who fared not so well at all. As a matter of fact, history takes record of those, though in small ways, those ministries, those churches that didn't fare so well, as a matter of fact, they utterly failed. Many examples of the past of persistent faithfulness and peculiar failures. That's what I want to talk about in the introduction. Persistent faithfulness and peculiar failures. They could be charted all throughout uh, the trail 
of human history and church history. It is imperative that we walk this trail and be reminded of some principles that lead a nation, a ministry, or a region, or a community into persistent generational synergy and faithfulness. Here's what I'm believing God for in our generation. I'm believing God for per persistent faithfulness, not peculiar failures. I'm believing God for multi-generational synergy. We're believing God for generational persistence that's going to produce a fruit in the earth unlike we have seen before in our lifetimes. Maybe we could borrow from the title of one of Charles Olson's poems when he said, The chain of, re of, of I'm sorry, the chain of memory is resurrection. So what we're trying to do tonight, and indeed through SOAR, is we're going back to look at the chain of history because the chain of memory or the chain of history is indeed resurrection. It is by remembrance that we release the hope that rests with the fathers and the mothers beneath the ground upon which we now walk. Let me restate that. It is in the remembrance and the release of the hope that rests with our mothers and fathers who now rest beneath the ground that we are walking upon. So we're looking back. We're being reminded of key pioneers. Men and women whose hearts were ablaze with the glory of God. Men and women who struggled through great adversity. Men and women who struggled through great difficulty, but yet somehow they kept their hand to the plow. They became persistent. They became faithful. And they continued in their journey until ultimately they have impacted and transformed many generations in a row. I remember reading the words, and some of you all have heard me so many times refer to Dr. Philip Jenkins, who is a great historian. But I remember one time reading some words how he was pining away uh, about church history and the history of a global Christianity. And one of the questions that he asked that really kind of troubled me in some ways is he began to ask, why is it that the church has never developed a theology of extinction? Think about that for a moment. A theology of extinction. And part of the reason why he asks the question is because he knows all too well from the study of history that there are some faith communities that persist for generations, even millennia. But there are also ministries and churches that fail in a season. And when they fail, many times it's an utter disaster. The Coptic Christians, in no sense going into this too much, I suppose, but the Coptic Christians are one of those communities that really begin to excel in ways through millennia. The Coptic Church in Egypt is known as the Church of the Martyrs. And they are, by definition, the oldest continuously operating, functioning Christian community in the history of the world. Now think about that for a moment. They have the record for being persistent, faithful, all the way through millennia. They track their beginning even to the third century. And yet they're relevant even today in Egypt. Even though they have come, even in recent days, under tremendous persecution and the threat of terror by Islamic radical terrorism all throughout the Middle East, certainly there in Egypt. As a matter of fact, in April of 2017, Christianity Today magazine really began to do this amazing article about the Coptics, the Coptic Christians. And the article was entitled, Forgiveness. Muslims moved as Coptic Christians do the unimaginable. What was the unimaginable? The unimaginable was in the midst of terror, in the midst of their own families being slaughtered, 
in the midst of their own worship centers and churches being bombed by suicide bombers. It is the Egyptian Coptic Christians who stood up in the face of terror and began to forgive from their heart. I remember hearing one woman who actually forgave the terrorists who took the life of her husband and she began to applaud them by saying, you helped my husband get to a place I could never send him. What are the principles of the Coptic Christians of Egypt that we could learn that would enable us to be more persistent? We're going to be looking at that over the next few weeks as we determine principles for viable, synergetic, persistent, multi-generational anointings of revival and awakening that are going to shake the earth with the fire of God. Compare the Coptic Christians to many of the churches in North Africa in the 5th and 6th century who at the beginning of the Arab invasion, Northern Africa in the 6th century, many don't even realize this, but Northern Africa in the 6th century was absolutely one of the most thriving uh, regions in all of the world for vibrant Christianity. Many great leaders came out of North Africa in the 6th century. Leaders like Tertullian, Cyprian, leaders like Augustine came out of Northern Africa. And in the 6th century, it was a blaze for the glory of God. But the Arab invasion began and then it wasn't long, I don't remember exactly the year, about 564. Somebody's going to research that. But about that time, at the conclusion of the Arab invasion, within 50 years of that time, the Muslims were apologizing to the caliphs because they could no longer supply Christian slaves because in their words they recorded that Christians in Northern Africa are so scarce that we apologize. We can't even provide them any longer as slaves. What's the point there? The point is at the end of the Arab invasion that the Christian community of Northern Africa had been so decimated that the Christians had all but vanished. Now here's an amazing thought. I'm going to throw it out there and we're going to develop this more and more as we go forward. But one of the remarks that was made by an ancient historian of church history, it was so interesting to me. He marks with his own words, why is it that the church of Northern Africa so utterly failed? And one of the things that he began to say in his writing, he began to write himself, when Christianity becomes a religion of the party rather than a religion of the people. She has just entered the path of extinction. Now let's let that process just for a moment because going into Mississippi this weekend, I heard the Lord say, the church has become effective in campaigning for national elections. But what about our fruitfulness in the field? Come on, somebody. The Lord ultimately has not called us to be a political action committee for, a, for a, a person or a political party, whatever side we may be on, that they might win an elected office. God has given to us the fire that we might be fruitful in the field. So I want to encourage you today. Let's not settle to be effective winning elections. Let's not be satisfied until we are fruitful in the fields of God. So we need to look. Why did the Coptics persist and prevail for millennia even today? And why is it that the church in Northern Africa utterly failed in some amazing ways in the 6th century? Part of what we want to do in SOAR Part of what God has called us to do in our lifetime, what He's called Jennifer and I to do, is to rediscover the path of those who've gone before us. Not that we might tell interesting stories 
or not that we might remember amazing relics and artifacts of God's movings in the past. But He's called us to this assignment that we might remember those who have gone before us and that we might learn from them principles of our own persevering, principles of our own prevailing, principles of our own synergetic outpourings of the Spirit of God that we can begin to release in multi-generational ways. How do we build cultures of perseverance? How do we build generational synergy in the hope of what the Lord is about to do? It was interesting in that Christianity article, Christianity Today article, and you can research it if that you want. I believe the author's name was... Uh, well, don't hold me to this, but I believe it was Jason Casper. And in that article, he began to write, and he was interviewing one of the young people, one of the young Coptic Christians, about how they viewed the decimation of their buildings and their families through modern terror in the Middle East. And the young man responded, we respond with forgiveness. We respond with our heart. You know what the young man said to him? The Coptic church has always been the church of martyrs. But my generation has never had to practice it until now. And it's just amazing to me that part of the persistence of any community or nation spiritually or people revolves around the discipline and the commitment to remain persistent to the cause of God in our generation. How do we do that? How do we build multi-generational synergy? We labor faithfully in the assignment of God that He's given to us right now. That's part of what we must do. Secondly, we must put our hands to the plow and refuse to look back. Listen, the ministers of the Gospel who are as flames of fire are pioneers and men and women in every generation who are willing to put their hand to the plow and not look back, but become everything that God has called them to be. We stand like Nehemiah on the wall with a sword in one hand and a mason's tool in the other as we're rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And we refuse to come down off of the wall to entertain those who would be naysayers against us. Nehemiah had no time to get off the wall because the assignment that God had given to him, it mattered to him and it mattered to all of the nation. Listen to me, sore students and others that may be watching in. Let me just say to you, let me remind you, wherever you are, God has given you an assignment now. He's given to each of us an assignment. And we must be faithful to fulfill the dream and the vision of our heart. Don't get lost in that time of trying to fulfill others' dreams or visions. It was Jonathan Edwards who said, when God in so remarkable a manner took into His own hands the work for which we have begun, there was as much done in a day or two as at ordinary times could be done in a year. What we're believing God for is that as we labor together, as you and I in humility and honor and in holiness, we pursue the heart of the Father and we're willing to labor together from all over this country that we might see a generation arise. But in the midst of that, we each one are fulfilling our calling and our responsibilities. But in that, when God comes and He kisses the work, that we have begun. It's in those moments that Jonathan Edwards' words become so true. And his words were, what we could only get done in a, in, a, in a year, God was able to do in a day or two. So let's welcome tonight our pioneer. I want to introduce to you guys tonight a pioneer that you may well know, you may well have heard of, or maybe not at all. But I want to introduce to you tonight the amazing William Tennant who believed more firmly than most in his day 
that indeed it was the Lord's heart that all be taught of God. John 6, 45. The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6, verse 45, was a key verse for William Tennant, an amazing man of God whose life in the early days was full of adversity and setback. Born in Scotland, moves to Ireland, finally in frustration and futility, he makes his way to the young America. He makes his way to this continent and God begins to use him in remarkable ways. Even as the founding charter of Harvard University states, the goal of all education is not to acquire more theological knowledge, but to draw closer to the Lord personally. As a matter of fact, listen to these words from the Harvard University Charter itself. And I quote, And therefore, lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And so today we begin to find William Tennant. William Tennant was a father of education in America. He was indeed a founding father, if you will, of ministerial training, equipping, empowering. And we want to look at some attributes of his life. He was a courageous pioneer. And he was a courageous pastor. His heart was to train and equip generations. And indeed, he would do that. As a matter of fact, William Tennant, he trained generations that far exceeded the days of his own natural life. His vision outreached him by millennial. His generations, his vision, his call, it outlived him. And it certainly outperformed his highest aspirations for what God was about to do. His life was a testimony to John 6.45. It was the Lord's heart that all would learn and be taught of the things of God. I want you to see a picture of William Tennant that you might be able to identify him. But as we look at him, he was an amazing man whose heart was committed with his great vision and dream to teach and educate others of the great principles of God. William Tennant had a dream and he had the courage to pursue it. You know, the other day I felt like the Lord began to minister to me say, you know, that, that uh, any dream that's not pursued, seldom comes true. William Tennant was a pioneer who pursued his dreams. William Tennant was about to allow the adversity of his day to bring him into his greatest advancement. Let me just say to you guys for a minute right now, some of you all have been through adversity. Some of you have had setback. Some of you have felt like that you don't know how your ministry is going to move forward. and What is it that God wants you to do? And my friend, I just want to encourage you today that we discover the will of God in the midst of our circumstances. And even in the face of opposition, we find the will of God. William Tennant knew that very well. The trials of his life were far from over as a young man. He would indeed encounter trials and opposition and setback. Indeed, all of the days of his life. He was uniquely qualified by the calling of the Lord to train generations as few men before him did. And I, I, I just, this man is amazing to me. And I'm not sure that we have really given to him the place of honor that he deserves, both in the church and in our culture as well. William Tennant, he had a heart, a love, a passion for the generations that were coming after Him. How badly we need fathers and teachers. We need ministers of the Gospel who have seasoned years of experience, who knows what it's like to go through adversity, face opposition from a church or from a family, and begin to come out on the other side, not bitter, but believing God 
for the equipping and training of the generations who come after them? What made William Tennant such a viable candidate to train the next generations? Well, William Tennant, number one, it was the calling and the vision of God upon his life. Listen, let me just encourage you guys again because I just really feel this so strongly. And that is, let me, let me just say to you, let God define His call in your life. Don't feel like you've got to mimic your call or have your vision justified by others. Let the Holy Spirit affirm His call in your life. And learn that sometimes it's in our going that God shows up and He does amazing things, even preparing us and equipping us along the way. William Tennant was a man of God who was faithful in the years of his life to the calling and the vision of God. That qualified him to begin to release to the next generation principles of God for prevailing and persistent moves of the Spirit. Secondly, William Tennant, it's no small thing, he could speak fluently. He could read fluently. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. That may seem like a great challenge for many of us. But the truth of the matter is, in William Tennant's day, you could not be licensed to preach the Gospel until you could learn Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And he could speak them and read them fluently. Tennant was well seasoned by the years of advancement and adversity in the ministry. Number four, Tennant was experienced in the ministry teaching, training, and equipping others. Here's one of the things that I love about William Tennant, and that is William Tennant's teaching and training ministry. And you'll see in a moment just how far his ministry would reach. But you know where it began? It began in his own home. It began with his own children. He homeschooled his children. I'm not necessarily promoting that, but I'm just saying as a matter of record, he homeschooled his own children, and not only that, he taught his sons and daughter, and he equipped them for the ministry in his own home. All real training, equipping, empowering must begin in our own homes. Number five, Tennant knew Jesus personally. Now, you may say, well, that's a no-brainer. Well, but see, you've got to look at history not through our eyes looking back and interpreting it. Uh, that concept is called modernism. And right now, modernism is creating a platform in our nation to look back and judge our fathers based on the revelation knowledge that we have based on our world today, not as it was in their time. But in William Tennant's day, the church, it was much more important to them that you conformed to theology rather than you have a personal experience with Jesus. As a matter of fact, for much of the church, the concept of a personal relationship with Jesus was far from their wildest imagination. As a matter of fact, William Tennant, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and many others, many other young pioneers and older ones alike, they came into adversity by the church and by their culture because they went against the grain of the church by preaching it's not just conforming to a theology but it is a transforming encounter with the Lord Himself wherein we are saved by the new birth, wherein we are brought into the kingdom of God by our personal relationship with Him and that encounter of the new birth. So He was a man who was truly born again. And number six, finally, Tennant had received a strategy to accompany the vision that God had given him. Listen, guys, we all know it. I know it all too well. You can have a dream of revelation in a moment, but it sometimes takes a season of adversity and setback and even opposition works for your good. It works for all of our good. 
that in the place of adversity, God might release to us a strategy from a posture of humility. It was William, William Tennant who said, education is not about filling a pail, but it's about lighting a fire. So William Tennant was about to light a fire in the generations who were coming after him. It's hard to imagine the first great awakening without William Tennant. All of us have heard of George Whitfield. George Whitfield, as a matter of fact, when he met William Tennant, George Whitfield was younger than William Tennant's youngest son. But God used the Tennant family connected with George Whitfield to begin to release America's great awakening. William Tennant believed strongly and he taught often that the starting place for the saving as an, as an, of a nation was to change the way in which we train ministers of the gospel. Now, let that sink in a moment. He lived in a time where ministers were disciplined under a harsh hand of rigorous education and teaching. Their preaching publicly had to be approved in writing by elders older than that. They had to know Hebrew, Latin, Greek. They had to become well acquainted with philosophy and the, and the sciences and ecclesiology. And they had to become uh, accustomed to the knowledge of hermeneutics or the practice of preaching or teaching. It was a rigorous, disciplined time for the studies of a minister. But William Tennant knew we're not here to fill an empty pail or a bucket. We're here to light a fire. And he believed that by training generations, we could light a fire that could save a nation. There are many lessons that we can learn from William Tennant. And we'll be looking at him more, even in our next lesson in a few moments. But there are many lessons that we can learn from William Tennant. And I have them all right there in your notes. And so maybe you would want to discuss these. Or when we go live in a few moments, maybe some of you would want to discuss some of this. But there are many lessons that we can learn from William Tennant. Number one, he pursued his dream and his calling. I release you to pursue your dream, to pursue your calling. Don't settle. Number two, William Tennant homeschooled his own children for the ministry. And they would go on to do remarkable exploits for the Lord. It would be his, his son Gilbert who would actually invite, we, uh, invite George Whitfield to come to White Clay Presbyterian where we were just at a week ago. It was Gilbert Tennant, William Tennant's son, who invited him to come. And William Tennant, along with Gilbert and George Whitfield, saw a miracle in the open field. That miracle of rain falling from a cloudless sky and a magnificent rainbow to follow. That happened with us just last week in Newark, Delaware. And maybe you saw the video I posted of Pastor Chris Dino talking about that. But it was the tenants who made room for George Whitfield and were so inspirational in seeing the beginning of this great awakening. Lesson number three, he was true to his own convictions and he trained generations. Why do I say he trained generations? He only lived one lifetime and much of it was filled with adversity and loss. Well, the year 1739 it was probably William Tennant's worst year of his whole life for a number of different reasons. The church was against him. The denominational structure was all against him. The threat of his school was to be shut down. And it was in that year he lost to death his own daughter, his only daughter. Her name was Eleanor. She died at age 30. And 1739 was a horrific year for William Tennant. But what he did not know is in the same year, in the midst of his adversity, 
God was bringing a young man from England across the Atlantic in a ship called Elizabeth. And he left England on August the 13th and he arrived in Philadelphia on November the 6th and he preached at White Clay Presbyterian the first Sunday of December in 1739. So in the midst of his worst year, God was about to converge his greatest relationship with George Whitfield. And when the two of them met, the awakening was on, partly because Whitfield had the fire of a young revivalist. And William Tennant had the seasoned discipline of an old scholar who was willing to raise up and train the generations who came after him. Number four, he was aware education, like all of ministry, is about relationship. I've told young people all of my ministry career, I've told them that ministry is about 98% relationship. Cherish the relationships and the people that God brings into your life. You have no greater asset and you have no greater resource in your life and in your ministry than the people God brought into your life. So we must learn how to honor them, make room for them, prefer them, and see the synergy that is created as a result. Lesson 5, he opened his life and his home to the students. He didn't just open up his notebook. He opened up his life. William Tennant and his wife Catherine built a home. Right? They built. They got the home first. The home was built in the, uh, like the 1730s. And he got this home. And then he built the little building for the school. It was... His colleagues called it the Log College. They called it the Log College in a mocking way because they thought it was just ridiculous. It was only a two, 200 square foot log building that they built. Had no library, no staff, just a call from God. But William Tennant began to see the value of opening up his heart. His students would stay in his home just right close to the college. As a matter of fact, George Whitfield spent the night in that house as well. Uh, number six, he prepared the way through his faithfulness for God to save a nation through awakening and transforming revival. Number seven, he identified, qualified, and edified the unique gifts of all of those who attended the Law College. Now, in closing out this lesson, I, I wish we had more time to consider two of those students. One was John Redman, and the other one was John Hellfire Rowland. And uh, these two guys were absolutely amazing, though they were on opposite ends of the spectrum. John Redman would become one of the early physicians in America, one of the early doctors in America staff of the first hospital in America. John Redmond would train people like Benjamin Rush, who was um, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Very influential. Jennifer and I were just at his grave not a week ago. Then you've got John Hellfire Rowland. Probably no more needs to be said about John Hellfire Rowland. He believed that God had given to us the Old Testament law that we might preach the consequences of a life without God and then give to them the glorious hope of new life that could be found in Jesus. Listen guys, I want to close this lesson with this statement. There are many things we can learn from pioneers like William Tennant. And by the way, just so we're clear, there are today in 2017, there are over 61 colleges and universities in the United States of America who trace all of their roots back to this one man, William Tennant. Princeton University. I mean, the list is six, over 60 universities and colleges, high schools, that all trace back their roots to this man who refused to let adversity 
cut him off. And he built him a little log college and he pursued his dream. And you know what? From his time till now, he continues to train and train and train leaders from all over the world. Okay, we're going to take a minute, take a break, and uh, come right back in here about 10 minutes.